This is the Horse Radio Network. Are you a hunter poofy? That's what the German riding instructor says I am. This week, we're talking to the Facebook famous horse trainer himself. Also, McLean Ward is the best in the saddle, but also as a human. We have a new favorite subscription box, and we forever rejoice in being weird horse girls. Thanks for tuning in. From Heels Down Mag, a podcast where horse pros chat about what's happening in the horse world over drinks. Welcome, Welcome to Happy, to Happy Hour. Hour. I'm Justine Griffin. I'm Victoria Goff. And I'm Jessica Payne. Welcome to episode 42 of Heels Down Happy Hour. Hey, guys. Hey. Hey. So happy to have you back, Victoria. Thanks for coming uh, back to the show. It's great to be back. Um, I'm, I'm loving the time difference, though, because it's about quarter past that, nine in the evening. So um, I'm, uh, it's getting late for me. But um, yeah, it's great to be back. Awesome. Well, this episode is brought to you by Smart Pack. And Jess, I just wanted to mention this. Did you get the, have you tried the new Smart Pack Leather Lover Cleaner? Yes. And it is, it smells really, really good. It Did smells you- like. It smells like soap I want to put on my body, but it's for my saddle. <laughs> I know. And you're like, please don't wash her. And like, but you almost <laughs> want to like bathe in it. And you're like, okay, that's right? a little bit pushing it. But no, and it's like you use the smallest little amount and it goes for forever. It really does. It lasts forever. And it's a big container. Yeah. It, it, it's pretty cheap. It's 19.95, And I, just, I thought the same thing. You don't have to use a ton. It lasts a long time. It smells really fresh. It's got like a lemon lavender type scent to it it's awesome so i i just keep it in my tack trunk it's like great really quick cleaner and conditioner to use like right after you ride and boom you're ready to go done so if you guys want to check it out you can go to bit.ly slash smart pack leather lover well i'm also really excited because that facebook group that we're all becoming obsessed with heels down happy hour lounge somebody bought on there they um, decided to give us a cocktail. So you guys have to send us your cocktails. You can either email it to us, join the Facebook group, put it on there because I love seeing everybody's favorite drinks. So Emma this week decided to give us a good old old fashioned, but it's Wisconsin style. So I can't wait to try this because I am a bourbon person. And so she says, do two orange slices, two brandied cherries, a little bit, like three dashes of bitters, a sugar cube, and then use like two ounces of like seven, or no, just a dash of like seven up or salsa or whatever you want, Sprite, and then two ounces of brandy instead of the bourbon. Mm, that does sound really good. I love an old fashioned, so I was super into this one. Have you tried it yet? I have. It is sweet. Oh. It's sweet. So it's, it's like sweet. a sweet okay. take on an old fashioned, but it's like a really, it's really good. Oh. I love it. So oh, I'm going to have to try it because Doug and I love old fashions. Oh, you'll like we, this one. It's a nice when you twist. come to Aiken, they have like a taco sushi old fashioned. So it's kind of same, like a little bit of a different twist. So Ooh. I love good old old fashioned. Yeah, totally. So what do you have for us with news? So, uh, okay, well, this is crazy, uh, crazy, not crazy, but all right. So I found this news story that's not necessarily horsey, but it is because to Did us, you make it? Did you make it horsey? <laughs> It's not quite like the the drunk online shopping one, but okay. um, so I found this story that the, well, I'm just going to read you the headline, and it says people are turning to medication made for horses to treat rosacea, and dermatologists are freaking out. So people are using literally using ivermectin, uh, like obviously lower doses to treat skin conditions, and because it's cheaper, I, I guess huh. that, like getting the FDA approved. There's a topical gel. It's called Sulantra for humans and, and it's super, it's super expensive. It's yes. super, super expensive. Cause I have a friend that has really bad, like eczema rosacea, like, and it's on his like ankles and everything. Like he's allergic to everything. And so he oh. literally is trying to get insurance to pay for the Zulantra, but don't tell, I hope like he doesn't listen to this and start using ivermectin because <laughs> I'm a little concerned about this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like they're, you know, the concern is real from, you know, real doctors that are saying, don't do this. I I mean, I can totally, I could totally see a horse person going, if I'm giving this to my horse, I'm going to use it and I'll be fine, you know, but it, yeah, it says here that cilantro typically costs several hundred dollars, even with insurance, which is crazy. That's unbelievable. 
And you know you can get ivermectin in bulk for like, you know, yeah. dollars a tube. So Oh my gosh. That is it's gonna be crazy. I wonder if it really works though. Yeah, I guess anecdotally, people who have done it are saying that it works just as well. So I mean, disclaimer, we do not endorse this no. or show. <laughs> Do it at your own risk. Um, but hey, people are using ivermectin to treat their skin conditions. I'd, li- um, I'd just like to know who was the first person to give it a try, who looked at this uh, <laughs> equine treatment and thought, you know, I'm going to put this on my skin. That's, that's quite a, a risky strategy. Oh, my gosh. OK, well, let me read you this quote that fits exactly with that. And kind <laughs> of I'm going to try not to go on a like soapbox rant about what's wrong with the world. But let me read you this quote from the story. I decided to try the horse paste because I saw some before and after pictures of a young woman with rosacea on a rosacea support page on Facebook. <laughs> oh, who needs doctors when you have Facebook? You could, yeah, you could just treat Facebook. yourself. <laughs> yes, it's what's wrong with the entire world right now. But anyway, <laughs> okay, right. well, I have something that's not wrong with the world. I'm okay, going to jump in because mine is so McLean Ward is undoubtedly one of the best U.S. riders, if not like in the world. He's amazing. He's the nicest person to talk to. I've had the pleasure to meet him and everything, but even more so, he went above and beyond and he invited this mom and this little 12-year-old little boy who is super cute, Ziggy, and the mom's name is Megan, and Ziggy is little boy Hoffman, that basically they were like on a blog. The mom was talking about, you know, basically how they'd love to go down. She'd like pinned it on the plot horse or something like that. But some blog, she basically said she'd like to go to visit and experience the equestrian Mecca. That is the WEF in Wellington. And McLean reached out. He read the blog and said, we'd love for you to come down. I really think you guys should. And she said, like jokingly, well, yeah, if you're inviting us and he ended up messaging her a cell number and basically they got put together he invited them to come down go to the horse show like they're the cutest pictures like matching little pictures of McLean and he posted something on social media saying like it was a pleasure to have Ziggy and his mom there this week and that he has a bright future and to keep tra- like following his dreams and then he signed like an Hermes tie and gave it to him as like a parting gift it was the cutest thing some of the pictures are adorable like they're walking the course together it is precious no, it's That's awesome. <laughs> so I think the I think Ziggy had dealt with some bullying in school, right? And that's yeah. yeah, which is really sad. So he I think he had some confidence issues, but like imagine getting to spend like four days straight with McLean Ward in Wellington and ride with him and talk about boosting your confidence, right? Yeah, right. Like your idol, like, oh here, let's go hang out for the week. So kudos to like McLean because he is he what a, a nice guy. guy. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. He's really, really nice. Oh, I know. That's a great so. story. So, Victoria, what do you have for us news this week? So there's been one story that's been dominating the headlines over here in the UK, and that is the equine flu outbreak. Um, apparently, there's been more cases found in the month of January than there was in the entire of last year. So there, there is a lot, a, a significant rise in the amount of cases that's going on. Um, wow. And it, it actually ended up ending um causing a break in racing for six days over here in the UK which is a big deal you know it it was making headlines all over the press it was on the tv news people were talking about it and we're heading up to the Cheltenham festival in about four weeks time and that's one of the biggest race meetings um you get hundreds of thousands of people who, who attend Cheltenham you know it's the the kind of pinnacle of the national hunt racing season and there was talk that it could be threatened so the whole horse world and racing industry were thrown into absolute panic um so now we're in a kind of state of just trying to keep it contained so everybody's being recommended to have vaccination booster shots and they're avoiding you know trying to avoid cross contamination so not taking your horse to anywhere where there's been an outbreak or um if your horse is showing any symptoms to just stay at home and so yeah we're we're all reading these warnings every day and hoping that we can keep a lid on it oh that is so scary because we had a scare also here in the U.S., because at the World Equestrian Center in Ohio, they had nine cases confirmed of the same thing. And so we actually just got notified for Pine Top this weekend 
it is basically we have to make sure at jumper shows, we've always had to have our vaccine reports and everything and make sure we have proof of like them having it. And it's a USCF rule, but now a lot of events have never, you know, eventing events have never made us like kind of show proof of it without having like an FEI event where you have to have their passports. But now we are actually having to show proof of it and actually have like a letter from our vet saying that these are the dates that it was given with, you know, the lot number and everything. Yeah, similar over <laughs> here. And I've always been quite strict on it, it even in riding club competitions um, as well as, as FEI competition and affiliated events. So they've never been as stringent about checking, but you could always be asked to do spot checks and you had to make sure that you were within the year. But now a lot of um, competitions are saying that you have to have a six month vaccination booster and uh, and there has to be seven clear days between that and when you compete. So actually yep. it's leaving quite a lot of people in, in tricky situations and also in racing they're they're being advised the same and all the people who have got um winter jump horses don't want to be vaccinating their horse in the in the middle of the season they want to do it in the summer when the horse isn't doing very much so yeah it's been a real talking point over here wow yeah because we do it it's interesting because we do ours january and june so they are almost on off months kind of yeah. Um, so like, right, because they're ramping up, like they're not competing that first week of January. And if they are, then we back it up a little bit. But I mean, rarely do we have, there's definitely not an event in January for us till the very end. So we have, we've basically had to like throughout time back up our vaccines because they used to be spring and fall and we didn't want to do it in the middle of competition season. So we basically now do January and June. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So something we have to, but it's kind of crazy. Totally yeah. crazy. So for more news and commentary, you guys should really subscribe to the Heels Down Brief. It's our weekday morning news blast. We share all kinds of super fun things, but probably my favorite thing is our lastly LOLs at the end of every email, which is just a nice break of humor to start your day. And if you guys want to sign up, you can do that by going to bit.ly slash HD Brief. All right, so we have a super exciting product review to share with you guys. And Victoria, I want to ask you to see if this is becoming like a cool trend overseas too. So right now it's like everything is a subscription box, not necessarily with horses, but you can get like Bark Box for your dog or Stitch Fix where they like mail you clothes once a month in a box. And now uh, we're really starting to see them come out in, in equestrian stuff. Do you have subscription boxes that come to you in the mail? Yeah, it's become quite a big thing over here as well. This one is the best. This one, it is. I we just got the latest box, and I did a video of it. We'll post it. It will be floating around, so you guys will have to see it on social media. And I kind of opened up the box and showed everything that was in there. And there were some great products, like anything from a little bit for your horse, a little bit for you, a little bit for your house, like a little bit of everything. And that's what I kind of liked. It's something different. It's not just you know, the grooming side or that, like there was a great t-shirt and a belt and a really cool, like print, like art print. And so you liked the liniment bombs. Yeah. So I, I want people to know we're talking about the Cavalli club box. Oh, you never um, even said the name. I never even said the name. No, that's okay. <laughs> we got I carried away. It was so, we were so I know we we're so excited about it. Actually, Jess and I have been talking about it for like the last week because we've had the box and have been waiting to talk about it for the show. But it, it is so, it is definitely by far the best box I've ever gotten. In Cavalli, you spell that C-A-V-A-L-I, if you want to look it up. And their website is cavalliclub.com. And they do, be, oh, like, seasonal boxes. So I guess it would be, like, four a year, like, quarterly boxes. But they, they're beautiful. They do a really wonderful mix of self-care stuff. Like, I got a cuticle oil, which is not something I would ever go and buy myself from the store. But since it came in the box, you know, I felt compelled to try it. But then they have all kinds of interesting things. Like, Jess, you mentioned, I really like how they had the booklet where, like, right when you open the box, it it is a really well done, like, very thoughtful, written out, everything, every product and every brand that is in your box. So you get to read a little bit about the company. They're all small businesses. So I felt like I was supporting small equestrian businesses that I, you know, that I would want to support anyway. I think my, if I had to pick two favorite items, like you said, Jess, in this box, I really liked, there's a company that makes 
liniment bath bombs and they came in this adorable little cloth bag but they look like something i would use in my bathtub at home like it's literally a bath bomb but it's liniment for your horse and i i got to use it at a horse show recently and they worked great oh that's awesome i haven't gotten to try them yet so i'm really really excited but the t-shirt also i'm not really a t-shirt person but it's so soft it is and so that was the zebra herd right yeah herd of zebras herd Herd of of zebras. zebras Yeah, it is so soft. I love the color. I had like a really pretty, like bright lit mint green one. Oh, was- see, I got, I got even, it's funny because I'm not really a mint green kind of person. So I probably wouldn't have worn that. I got, they must have known to send it to us, right? I got yeah. kind of like a maroon red color that I totally would wear all the time. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's too funny. So then, and then also there's an unbelt in it. I don't know if, and I'm obsessed. I already have a bajillion of these belts, which basically they're a fabric belt with a really cute buckle. But what I love about it is that it doesn't create like a bulge in your pants. So if I, like I could wear them with jeans and like a nice blouse to work and it won't look like you have that, you know, that bulge from your belt if your shirt's too long. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no. And it just looks like you might as well not wear a belt because it looks like you're adding extra to your waistline that nobody wants. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's a really cute belt, but they look really, they come in really funky colors. Like I got like a really rust colored green in the box which again is probably not a color I would have picked out myself, but I've gone out of my way to find riding outfits that match it. And I'm really happy with it. So. Oh, that's cool. See, like I, they, same thing. I got the Navy one and I'm really excited because it goes with like all of my breeches already. So I haven't um, actually seen that belt before. Did you know about the belt before this? I did. So I own See, a couple I of them already. That's, I had no idea about it. And they're, they're, they last forever. And what I love about them is I don't even take them out of my breeches when I wash them because they're just fabric. You can throw them right in the wash. Oh my and, gosh. And I don't know if great. I could do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm lazy and I'm like, this is the best belt ever. <laughs> oh my gosh. But so if you're interested, Cavalli Club, I mean, it's, it's a very high quality box. We also got saddle covers from the tax shop in yep. Ocala. And it is a beautiful saddle cover. I was really impressed with that too. Yeah. I'm like super excited about the whole box. If you guys want to try this box, it is amazing. It's got some high quality products. I really recommend going to their website and kind of checking out about it. And it's cavalliclub.com and that's C-A-V-A-L-I-C-L-U-B.com. And also right now, if you go, you get $10 off your first box. If you use the promo code heels down at checkout, do heels down H E E L S D O W N and get $10 off. It'd be great. Yeah, it's super great. So you can sign up quarterly and get billed every three months with, you know, when every box ships every three months, or you can sign up yearly and just, you know, pay one fee and get, you know, the four. But you save here. money. You save money if you do the yearly. Yeah, too. totally. You save it's worth more it. money. So. You save like 20 bucks. It's worth it. Yeah. All right, guys. So I'm really excited to introduce our next guest. And I'm pretty sure all of you have seen him on Facebook at least once. So uh, Ronnie Reamer, I should, probably should have asked you to make sure I was saying your last name correctly. The German riding instructor is here. And Ronnie is an accomplished Grand Prix and championship rider with over 20 years of experience in the horse sport industry. He's ridden both in Europe, specifically in Germany and other parts of, and then came over here to North America. So he knows the difference between riding the European way and the American way, and he combines both styles. But most of all, he he has all kinds of interesting viral videos. And probably my favorite thing you've ever said, Ronnie, is the Hunter Poofies that I love so much. <laughs> but, yeah. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That introduction sounded so professional that I would say I wrote it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, yeah. how did I come up with the German riding instructor? It actually was, it was a fun idea. We were sitting on the porch with uh, some friends and that, that whole thick German accent. And we were like, we need to cater to like more people. Like we, we need to give more lessons. We need to do more education and then we came up with that accent and it actually was like like a like a a semi pg version of into like trying to get hunter riders to come to a jumper training and (laughs) okay like we were all in stitches at that time and then it kind of like faded away it was just an afternoon joke and then i was on the way to wellington and that that 
drive was so boring and I was on the passenger seat and I looked over to my buddy and I was like, you know what? I think this weekend I'm going to make us famous. And he was like, oh, Jesus, Ronnie, please don't. <laughs> and, um, and then like one of the first videos from that German riding instructor persona actually then happened during my time in Wellington when I was there and telling everybody that there are so many rings except the dressage people. And when the feedback was like, I would say like 90% positive, I was like, okay, I think I should, I should keep going with that. Yeah. So then, so now, I mean, it went viral. I mean, it, I, what was your most popular video? Do you know? The five points for the trainers that, that video hit over a million views. Holy moly. That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you keep up with like uh, your audience now? Like how often do you create videos or is it just more like when you have time or when you feel like it? I have to say, I have to say when we started last year, I was like way more on cue about it. This year, we have a barn full of sales horses and some students here. And we had some upgrades done at the farm that really took so much time that I have to say, I was very, very slacking for, for most of the time now. I still kept a little bit of storytelling throughout the clinics. But I have a long list on my notepad now for new videos that oh, no. What's probably coming? <laughs> start hitting in the next couple of weeks when, when I have a little bit more breathing time and we take like a week off from the horse show. And now that we have all the work done at the farm, there's going to be a little bit more time for craziness again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So are you like, do you, do you, I know you have sales horses, but do you, you're an instructor too. So you have clients. No, I don't have clients. I have students. Students, McDonald's, okay. McDonald's has clients. Okay. <laughs> Good point. So what do your students think of this? Are you like are you like that? Are you larger than life personality when you're giving well, lessons? Okay. I have to say, like, my lessons, my clinics, and my writing, I take very, very, very seriously. But I think by birth, I'm a little bit more of a loose, funny person anyways, I have to say that my style of teaching definitely softened up a little bit since I came into the States compared to the old German, yeah, kind of like army style teaching that I had there and how I was taught. And a lot of like, there's, there's a lot of things that have to do with that while I changed, why I changed it. First of all, today's generation is a little bit more soft headed okay. and people and people tend to yeah, I rather want to hear the good than the bad. And when you tell them like most of the bad, they're like, well, I'm, I'm, I'd rather switch trainers to somebody that just like pets me on the head and tells me how good I am. <laughs> what I can understand for the amount of money you pay for this sport here in the States compared to Europe, you kind of feel a little bit entitled to success and instant success. What I don't agree with, um, the other reason why I got like a little bit more softer on my training approach was I, 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 I kind of like had my head in, in, in some other training sessions where I saw then from the outside how it looks like when you are like a little bit harder or a little bit tougher or like this specific person like definitely crossed the line to a point where I was like, ah, okay, that was now a little bit like below the belt. And it always says like you, you, you get more flies with honey than with vinegar. And I have to say, especially when I go to clinics, people are already intimidated with a new person coming in and they're already like a little bit shaky and they don't know what to expect. And if you then go in, in that military status, the only thing you're going to do is like you shake them even you shake them up even more. They get way more tense and just brain capacity starts shutting down. And at that point, they're. Like, whatever you say, it just is like water off a duck's back, where it's like they, they're so tense that you, it's not approachable for them to even consider learning something because it's more being scared than being, you know, uh, adaptive to learning. Sure. Well, and what you, and I love how you kind of talked about the difference training and riding in Europe and America. And you say, like, a part of that's like with the military training, all that. Which one, what do you find is like the biggest difference between the two? You talk a little bit about like, you know, the softer this, but like with the actual training, do you find there's actually a difference between the two? Like how people teach and how people ride between Europe of what you were dealing with and then changed in America or? 
Okay, so when I the first when I came first to the states, I was like very very much drilled in that like old school eighties nineties maybe early like two thousand riding style of Germany. What has its good and its bad sides? Where the good side comes in is really flat work that I think in the states here is is a big lag. lag and just the horsemanship education that you bring over from Europe that is necessary in order to get your registration to go to a horse show, where here you just hit a couple of clicks and you, you can go to the horse show. But then what I have to say, what I really started liking was the, the lightness on course from, from the top American riders, mm -hmm. because they, they kind of like bring a little bit of that old school thoroughbred ride, where it's like very light in the front and very loose and forward where it kind of looks a little bit more like the horses in a free jump shoot than that old school German ride where it was like almost like head in the chest. And it's, it's like, it's very old school because these horses are definitely not bred these days anymore. The breeding got way lighter and, and way more light influence and body type wise in the horses that that old school riding. You needed more that anymore. lighter American riding. Exactly. So yeah. for me to starting to combine the both was I, I definitely took the flat work and the balance um, out of out of that European riding school, but try to combine it with a little bit more loose horse in front of you where it's not that cramped down onto the chest where like basically the nose is the furthest point forward of the horse. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So about the, I got to talk to you about the Hunter Poofies because that's probably one of my, uh, I got to go back to your really videos want to? because they're my, <laughs> they're my favorite. I literally, I thought, you, I thought you wanted to keep it PG. Well, <laughs> Justine said that that was not me first uh, off. Okay. Justine keeps it PG, but I love like, where did you come up with the name Hunter Poofies? Oh, well, that's what I've been dying. I when think, I watch the videos, okay. it's hysterical. Okay, so it actually, I actually didn't realize that I said it. <laughs> the, first time, the first time I actually said it was in the video that I made about uh, Kelly Farmer and Larry Glefke yes. after the article that they got off the hook again due to a, like a mistake in the laboratory again. And it kind of rubbed me off the wrong way that... I was just voicing my opinion there because I was like, okay, that's like, I, I, don't, I don't care what it's going to do to me. And at that point, I really also didn't care because first of all, I, I don't buy or sell hunters. And second of all, like if people don't agree with me on that issue, I don't want to do with them business anyway. So at that point, I knew it, it, I wouldn't lose any clients that I would want to do business with in the future anyways. And it was basically just like a really shoot mode, hot topic that just came out. And then when I posted it, like a lot of people, like then I started reading the comments and a lot of people picked up on that hunter poofy thing. And then I was like, what is a hunter poofy? And then I watched my video. <laughs> and I was like, when did I say that? And it actually started catching on so much through that video that it basically, it's it, like that word poofy, I'm kind of using now as like a universal Everything. word. You know, it could be a jumper poofy, it's a hunter poofy, or, you know, if. Well, you if called I'm it a dressage. Her, you said the dressage poofy when you were the doing. Dressage poofies, exactly. So it's like, you know. I'm trying to be co politically correct and, and gender neutral here. So I need to be <laughs> oh, for all of them, you know? I thought um, this was a word you'd used for forever and like, that no, was it. That is no, hysterical. It was a hot, it, it was just like a really shoot interview hot moment. And then actually um, uh, one comment from Britain came that was like, do you actually know what a poof is? And I was like, no, I don't. And then he explained it to me and I'm like, now it fits even better. So what's so a poofy? Wait, <laughs> wait, Victoria should explain what the poofy yes. is. <laughs> what is a what's a poof? So it means like a footstool, like that's the term of it. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, yeah. So does Ronnie? Ronnie, like, do people recognize you from your videos now? Like, do you go to horse shows and people go, "Oh my God, that's the German riding instructor"? 
Yes, a couple of them. And some of them, I think they do, like, just from the looks of it. But I don't think they're then, like, like brave enough to say something. But I have to say, <laughs> after the first couple, especially especially after that, after that Hunter drug controversy video, a lot of people started greeting me at the horse show that never greeted me, like, in the three <laughs> years that I was there before. But it wasn't it wasn't of lack of like we didn't know each other, but I was like 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 I'm a very outgoing person, so I'm like morning, 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 and like I never got something back. And then after that video, people started like responding and I'm like, hey, look at that. It just <laughs> all, didn't who I was. all I did is I just needed to make this whole video about this whole persona and people would talk to me. Who knew? You know, you know what the you know what the okay, there's there's a funny and sad part of it. Like the German riding instructor persona has been so good to me and I was always always a fan of like entertainment anyways and that that was basically one of the first things that my my English teacher told my mom because he was also like the confidential teacher for the for the kids and like every time it was like parents day and they and my parents came in and all the teachers were like oh he's horrible he's like he doesn't pay attention he's here he's there he's just like out of the window the other day, he was like sitting on the on the cupboard and scared the shit out of me. And um, I was always just like the class clown. And then, like my English teacher actually said to my mom, "It's like, you know what? Don't worry about it. He doesn't fit into that normal mold, anyways. He's gonna be somewhere in the entertainment industry, anyways. So it's kind of funny that like I was able to combine my urge for that entertainment with my passion and 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 love for the horses gotcha i don't know you guys have any more questions or we did have a question from our facebook group that ronnie i think you could answer it is a serious training question amy who is a listener to our horse show or listen to the show she wants to know like tips on how to train your eye to see distances so do you have any tips that you work with your students on like how to how to develop a good eye to see the distance yeah, get glasses. <laughs> <laughs> if only um, were that easy, huh? Yeah. I was talking I was talking to my wife yesterday about that when I read the email with with the with the question. I have to say, like I, I really had to dig down deep for an answer for that because I was very fortunate to have like a natural eye for it. So if you never had to use exercises to train it, it's kind of like with the language, you know? If you ask me, like, why do you, why do you use this in German? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't know, we, we just do, you know? Something, something you never had to learn, it's hard to then reach forward. So I was thinking about, like, a lot of exercises and, and I think a, a lot, of, lot of good exercises are always ground poles and, and cavaletti work. And the other thing that always gets underestimated is a straight and rhythmic horse. I always say, like, the distance you have is secondary. As long as you have a forward-moving horse, a rhythmic horse that is balanced sitting on the hind end with a motor up to the jump, there will always be a distance for you. And people get so hung up to always hit it, like, on the spot. And then it's so easy for me to just, like, snap them out of it and say, like, okay, I'm going to pull up now a video from McLean Ward or Busy Madden from a course, and now there's like 14 jumps, and now tell me how many times they were like dead on the spot and how many times they were a little bit deep and a little bit wide. And it's, it's, it's very eye-opening if you, if you really look at it that way that, no, they don't always have the perfect golden spot on takeoff or landing. But they always get away with it because they have a forward moving horse that's light in the front end, sitting on the hind end, and it's balanced and straight. And I think this is the most, most, most important part. Because a lot of lot of riders, when they they are a little bit scared of not seeing a distance, they come around the turn and they always think, like, shoot, I don't see anything. I just I pull one more time, maybe it's there then. And then it's still not there. And then they pull again and then it gets lower and the stride gets shorter until you always have this chippy distance 
because your horse will not be able to go for the long stride with with this less amount of forward movement. So if they keep if, changing the distance with the balance instead of just riding the balance a lot of times. Exactly, because if you look at a horse naturally in a jump shoot, you will never see a horse that comes through a jump shoot, sees a jump, and then just like adds and adds and adds and adds. <laughs> yeah. They always come flying. They always come flying out of the turn, and they're always moving forward. So you like just comparing these. Like if you put them in a jump shoot. The way they do it there is kind of like how you want to preserve the horse under the rider. The problem that a horse has jumping is actually the rider on top of it. And that's, that's I think, is the biggest issue. And when I do lessons or clinics, what I always try to explain is, like, try not to be the biggest burden on your horse while you ride. You, you, you just want to be a guiding tool for your horse, especially in show jumping. All you want to do is tell the horse, Go left, go right, and keep it in a nice forward rhythm, but let the horse do its job. Because there's a great video that I always show when, when people ask me, like, what do you think about, like, the riding here, the riding there? There's a kid in an in a indoor arena in Germany, and she jumps a course, and the first one is deep, the second one is wide, she gets left behind, the horse chips at the next one, and then into the combination, there's another chip, and like just the form and the bascule of the horse looks horrible over the first four jumps. And then she gets shot out, out of the tag, and then she lands on the ground, and the horse runs off. Now the indoor is so tight that the horse keeps running, but there's always jumps in the way. And now you see the horse in the same rhythm, in the same forward movement, always finding a perfect stride to the jump, always finding a nice rhythm around the turn. And now the horse looks like a beautiful jumper where the first four jumps, you wouldn't have paid $5 for that horse. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you, you, you have to realize that we as riders are the worst thing that can happen to a horse that just wants to jump clean. So we need to get our riding where this whole micromanagement has to be eliminated. It's it's like there is no micromanaging in horses. It, it's more counterproductive than it is productive where all you want to focus on, do I have a straight horse up to the jump? Do I have a balanced horse up to a jump? Do Am I, as a rider, being like center gravity in the middle of my saddle? Am I leaning forward? Am I leaning to the side? Am I hanging in the bit? Is my leg on? Is my leg off? You just want to be that perfect little minion just sits that just sits in the middle of the saddle, smoothly guides the horse through the course and let them do the job. That's My interesting. Philosophy. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So I have one more question. You talked about how you have all these notes on your bedside about the upcoming videos and stuff. Can you give us a sneak peek about one of them? Maybe $25, $25 on paper. <laughs> Okay, I had I had the I had the five I had the five tips to be a good trainer. Yeah. Um, there will be another top five video where I'm gonna go a little bit into the different types of trainers themselves, and then wow. there's gonna be probably one really really fancy video. Um, I just have to I just have to find somebody that can do CGI. Because I have a really cool video on it, but I don't think I'm good enough to to get it back together. Oh, and there's going to be a music video. Oh, <laughs> nice. oh, wow! All right, all kinds I of was stuff already, to look for too. I was already, I was already in the in the studio, and we recorded it. And now the guy is now sitting there for weeks and weeks and weeks, trying to make the voice not sound so horrible. <laughs> so. So he, he might, might be there for a couple more weeks. Yeah, he might gonna sit there for a little bit longer now. Um, but yeah, as soon as that that the the audio track is out, we're gonna start filming that. Nice. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and thank being you so much there. For me. Yeah, this was great. I mean, I'm the kind of guy I can talk for hours. <laughs> You're my kind of person. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Then we have to do it like only 40 more times. Perfect. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me again. Cut the cord with new Walls KM Cordless 2 Speed Professional Clipper. I don't know if you guys have used this clipper before, but I have, and I really love it. It's really great that it's cordless. 
Um, you're not wrapping your horse's legs up all, all around when you're trying to clip it, like do a full body clip. Uh, it's really quiet. It runs for two hours completely without a cord. Um, and it's the same high quality clippers that you we've come to know and love from wall. The KM cordless clippers also come with a five year hassle free warranty. And it also comes with accidental damage protection and free shipping from the walls service and repair center. So, you know, things happen. You can get your clippers repaired for free or at no cost and then get right back to work. So if you're interested, look for walls products um, on smart pack and pretty much anywhere else on the internet. So guys, I wanted to talk quickly about this whole idea. I mean, I really don't have to tell you guys, you grew up riding horses too, but it's funny. I feel like there's this meme culture that's like really latched onto horse girls. You know what I mean? And people make fun of us because we're weird and we like horses. Maybe we like horses more than people. I don't know. I don't think that's weird, but I think most of the rest of the world think it's weird. Have you guys ever felt that? Like felt some self-conscious because your friends in school or something were weird about your horse hobby? Yeah, I think I kept it quite quiet. I think I kind of had a bit of a double life. So a life <laughs> where I'd spend the weekends going to competitions and with my pony friends and, and it was all about riding. And then I would go off to, to school or later to university and just not really mention it very much. And, um, and uh, yeah, just because either I got really weird questions or people making assumptions or people would do that really annoying thing of, oh, you've got a horse, can I come and ride it? Which uh, I wanted to avoid at all costs. I think for me, I couldn't really avoid it. I basically was gone most Thursday through Sunday of high school and college. So basically you kind of got asked like, where are you going again? Like, why do you get permission to leave and everything else? So I was always like that person in school where they're like, oh, you have to go play horses. And I was like, okay, well, you can judge me all you want, but you're going to sit at home and play video games or whatever you want to do, which is fine, but I'm not judging you for that. So I kind of just kind of ended up getting learning to get a thick skin about it and just kind of ignoring what they said, because at the same time, like my horses were important and they, they were nicer to me than most of those people. So it's kind of like one of those things you're like, I kind of ended up getting like a barn family and barn friends and like, you know, what Victoria said is like, you go and you see all the people at the horse show and have it fun there and just kind of made it a bit more not listening to them. Like they just, you know, made it more like, okay, well, if you're jealous or whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter, but I'm not listening and I'm just going to kind of do my own thing and try to do the best I can in the horses and kind of move on. So, I mean, I think it's hard to do, but at the same time, finding, I think a barn family or something always kind of helps or barn friends or something at the horse shows. Oh, totally. I think you hit a good point just in just that, like the older you get, the less you care about that kind of crap. But then also you find your people, right? You find your people yeah. who even, you know, even my, my friends who aren't horse people, like they understand that this is important to me. So they're happy that I have something that's important to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it shouldn't matter, but yeah, I'm sure. I think my, even my adult friends probably still think it's weird that I spend my weekends getting up at four in the morning to go ride my horse in the mud. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, but it's interesting and whatever. I'm happy to be a weird horse girl. <laughs> exactly. A few years ago, I went to, um, I got dragged along to go hovercrafting and I was there at this like water sports center with all these people who were so into it and they were there with their Land Rovers and they were all kind of really into boats. And I just looked around and thought, what, what a weird way to spend your weekend. <laughs> and then it dawned on me how I spend my weekend driving to fields with an animal in the back of my lorry and riding around in circles. And I tried to explain this to a non-horsey person how I'd had this epiphany of what I do is quite weird and she went yes I'm not really sure what I do with my weekends I guess like go to restaurants and go to theatres and I'm like well I do that too but like what do you, what would you do with all that rest of the time if you're not riding or grooming or looking after your horse I don't I don't understand what people do with their time all right think about how much money we'd have I know <laughs> <laughs> we could buy a hovercraft and uh, right. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, it is time for Rose and Thorn. Victoria, I know you've played before, but does anybody want to volunteer to go first? Not me. I got to give a minute. Um, I can go first. So okay. um, 
my rose today is that um, I managed to sell one of my saddles, a dresser saddle, and I didn't even have to advertise it. Somebody just commented on Facebook that they were looking for one. She turned up on ter- time today, paid me the money, and it's gone. Now I just need to sell my jumping saddle. So that's my rose that it wasn't done. But uh, then I have to actually go through my thorn, which is now I have to buy two new saddles because my horse likes to change shape all the time. And oh, my oh. God. And, and I've, I'm actually uh, in the process of writing a bit um, for, for Heels Down about the trauma of buying and selling saddles and how one of these days I'm going to be able to say I want a custom made beautiful saddle that perfectly fits my horse. But until then, it's just this constant cycle of buy a new saddle, have it for a few months. Oh, it doesn't fit. Buy a new saddle. So, yeah, that's my rose and thorn. <laughs> Very much I'm, in- the- I'm impressed, though, that the person like showed up on time and it wasn't a yeah. hassle. Because I selling- know. <laughs> Any, anything on Facebook is such a, you know, like a crapshoot. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> so um, The girl was a groom. So I just thought, you know, surely she's going to be more trustworthy. So uh, it was all great. So kudos to her for doing exactly what she says. And let's hope she says it fits perfectly. And I never hear from her ever again. Right. <laughs> all right. So I'll go, Jess. You still need okay. time? Yeah, two more seconds. All right. So my rose is that... Um, in dis- for Christmas, my husband got me a chicken coop, and my rose is that we finally have chickens in my yard right now. Nice. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm really excited. And um, I picked, like, I bought them from a real farm, you know, like they lived in pastures on a horse farm and everything. And now they're settling into their urban life, their urban backyard chicken life. They seem somewhat traumatized. Like, we're, we're trying to open the coop door, like, hey, you can go out and, like, hang out in the yard. And they, refuse to leave the yard they won't go into the yard they like are stuck in the coop so i'm hoping they are not traumatized and that they <laughs> they get better but i know nothing about chickens so maybe that's my thorn because all i do this week is like look at things on the internet about how to raise chickens because i know nothing <laughs> about birds so hopefully i don't kill them fingers crossed oh my gosh <laughs> good luck for the chickens and that's Thank very you. nice that you've given them a home. That's lovely. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think they miss their old home, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, Jess, what do you got? Okay, I'm ready. So I don't really have like a good rose and thorn this week, but I've got stuff. So Aiken Showcase is going to be my rose, or it's called Grand Prix Eventing, I guess is what the real term of it is, is like the Wellington Showcase. They're doing the first one ever in Aiken, and it's next week. So I'm really excited. Like we have a bunch of people coming town and got VIP tickets and it'll be fun. Like it's going to be exciting to see. We've got Doug's riding in it and we just got, I think, confirmed that one of my students and Doug's students, she's going to do the test ride on her dressage horse. So it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really excited that it's coming to Aiken and it's just good for the community and everything. So I'm really excited about that. That would be really fun. So I guess that would be my rose. And then my thorn would be, don't really have one. Our North Carolina project's taking forever due to like weather and like a hundred different things. So we're getting like, eventually we'll be there, but I guess that would be my thorn. It's just still drawing to deal with that and it's process. So mm-hmm. eventually it will be great, but I guess that would be my thorn. That's been the only really annoying thing this last couple of weeks. I can't wait till you move there. Oh, me too. I can't wait to see it. I know. We're going to have a big party and everybody can come. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. We do have this great mailbag question that I think both of you will have really good perspective for Caitlin, who writes, how do you make the decision to keep showing or to stop for a while? I love showing, but I've moved eight hours away from the nearest shows for me. I have a three-year-old I want to, to show to sell as a prospect, but is it worth the money showing him or to just sell him? Or is it just selling him with a little to no record safer on the bank and still effective? I think I'll go first, I guess, on my point. It kind of just depends on what you want to sell him as. Because if it's an event horse or a jumper or a hunter, like it all kind of depends and like the money. So for me... It's more about like, what are you wanting to get out of this? Is it not fun anymore so that you don't want to show or, you know, what are the aspects? So it's kind of a harder question for me to answer because some event people love the idea of like a pro like prospect and stuff, but a lot of the jumpers, they don't. So you kind of have to get a record on it to sell it. So unfortunately 
I don't really have a good answer for this one this time. So I'd love to know what Victoria has to say about it. It's a bit of a strange thought for me, um, the, the idea of being eight hours away from your nearest show, because obviously Britain <laughs> is a tiny country. And so, you can go from um, top to bottom in that time, right? <laughs> you basically could, like every single international event, show jumping, dressage, free day eventing, yeah, everywhere <laughs> in that time in the entire country. So we're very lucky here. There is definitely uh, a market for three-year-olds with, with good breeding that maybe haven't done very much. And I know a lot of the pros are always out to try and buy those um, because they're the ones that they can actually make a real difference on or that have potential without having an initial massive outlay. Um, I guess one option over here would be to actually send to a professional for a short term, um, whether to just get a few shows under their belt and and have that on their record without having to do all the work and traveling yourself. So um, if that was an option, maybe do that. But otherwise, I think people would would still be keen on a horse with decent breeding and nice movement and a good temperament I think there was yeah still definitely have appeal yeah definitely I agree with everything you guys said that if it's a nice horse and not necessarily proven at horse shows I think you could still sell it fine I think your window of shoppers will you know, be a little bit limited and, you know, it has to be an experienced horse person or, or trainer that would be interested in a prospect that young. But if you did show it and you got, it also gave you some enjoyment because you haven't been showing and you got to go back to that environment, I would say that's a win-win for both of you, but it really just depends on your time commitment, your financial commitment, how long you want to keep them as a prospect, all that, but you've got options, I guess is our advice. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if you want to send us a question to discuss on the air, you can drop us a line in our Facebook group, which is the Heels Down Happy Hour Podcast Lounge, or you can send us an email at hello at heelsdownmedia.com. And also, if you want to hear more from us in general, please subscribe to the Heels Down Brief at bit.ly slash hdbrief. And many thanks to this week's sponsors, Smart Pack, Cavalli Club, and Wall. And all right, guys, that's it. It was fun. Thanks, guys. And cheers. Cheers. Cheers.